Well, I recognize that all of you sacrificed to be here, so thank you very much for taking the time. Liesel has asked me to speak about healing wounded hearts, and the World Health Organization over the past decade, and even more recently now, has adopted the concept of biopsychosocial spiritual. So there has been a complete shift, or should I say an extension of the current model, realizing that uh, you know, this is a very broad area and we are struggling to keep track of what we're doing already and now we need to introduce this concept of modern spirituality and how do we do that in the framework of ethical and various social and religious issues and sensitivities. Now what I hope to do is to give you a fresh look and to approach it slightly differently than you might expect in the hope that it would give you freedom freedom to consider people as people, humans as humans, dignity and patient-centeredness as the basis for what you say. I will be touching on references relatively quickly, but I have included these quick reference codes. So if you've got smartphones and tablets and so on, you can take a screenshot and that'll actually take you to the website. So if you want to track the articles and the references, you can actually do that or you can get it afterwards when it's posted on YouTube. As I said, the World Health Organization glossary now includes the concept of partnering with patients, not only biopsychosocially, but also spiritually, and being able to synchronize their beliefs and worldviews. And in fact, there's a host of literature not only justifying the need for it, but already providing tools with which you're able to assess patients' spiritual needs. Because that's the big thing within the bigger picture of quality of life. And as we know, it's certainly a relevant thing when we get to life and death or end of life situations. But basically all but the most transient health challenge produces challenges on meaning of, purpose of, and basically sense of life issues. People are challenged, whether they realize it or not. Now, for the most part, we approach this or we think about this in terms of branding. In other words, there are different religious constructs and you know, each one has his own. I want to avoid that in the following way, by recognizing human spiritual physiology. In other words, if we first and foremost recognize that humans have the capacity and therefore the needs of their spirituality to be considered, we are able to relate to them at that level without coming through the lens of a person's individual spiritual orientation. In other words, I can treat you with dignity as a human with a spiritual worldview even if mine differs completely from yours. And that's a very important perspective. Now I do hold strong personal spiritual worldviews within the Judeo-Christian spectrum and I'm keeping it broad deliberately so as not to be pigeonholed and that is definitely my personal point of departure but I have enormous respect for people of other persuasions of faith because they are pursuing the truth and one does trust in that process and I do consider their dignity in that process. So we want to go beyond the urgency of proselytizing, imposing your faith, or you know the awkwardness that can happen around this. And, and turn it around, recognize your patients also got a spiritual aspect to them, and then determining how can I meet that? How can I assess what that need is? Is it a resource? In other words, they've got a community of faith that could help them, or is it a liability? because they believe they're being punished. Because it doesn't matter how many pulls you take if you think God is punishing you. It needs to be resolved at a different level. So, I caution you, as I've learned in many things, we start off from a point of ignorance, then eventually we get some sort of recipe and we think, well, that's it. And we tend to try and fit everybody within to that box. And then we hurt people and get hurt. And we start approaching things more cautiously, or as I prefer to say it, more wisely. So I'd encourage you not to remain in ignorance, not to move to arrogance, 
but that we approach it in wisdom, patient-centeredness and dignity. Now my background is decidedly conventional, qualified at the University of Pretoria, both my medical degree and aerospace degree, worked at Duke University uh, with a clinical research fellowship, I've worked with patients, astronauts and rats over many years. <laughs> I pursued hyperbaric oxygen uh, therapy because it was a missing piece and I'm so excited that my colleague and friend uh, Gregory Weir, vascular surgeon who's taken over the practice that I started at Eugene Marie is actually talking about it. Uh, you know, it's so wonderful to see things move on. Success without succession is failure. So I'm excited about these progressions. In a similar way, vestibular and balance rehabilitation and tinnitus were missing pieces. Patients were falling through the cracks, so that was an interest. Individualized medicine is something I'm still involved with at Marty's with uh, genomics. And then there was this question mark, how can we be responsible in the area of spirituality? And from a purely academic point of view, Harold Koenig at Duke University is probably one of the world's leaders. He's published enormous volumes of materials on the evidence about spirituality, religion and health. And I'll touch on some of the principles there. And then I've also been involved directly with a group in Thomaston, Georgia, that have had a faith-based seminar, five days, in which they orient people from a religious, particular faith-based perspective on issues of health. And I then did a study over three years to look at what the markers of spirituality, mental health and physical health were and how they changed. And we did this through the University of Stellenbosch. If there's time, I'll give you some of the outcomes. But we were very gratified by the, by the results. Depression changed, anxiety changed, and even trait anxiety changed. In other words, people's personalities of fearfulness changed. So we need to go there. The question is how. I'm going to start with an introductory summary. And if you choose to fall asleep during the remainder of my talk, please give me this window of alertness so I can just deposit this. The rest, you know, will become a bit more theoretical and for some of you I hope interesting, but please if I could just convey the following. First of all, and this is sort of my Magna Carta, and that is spiritual needs can be, can be assessed without prolonged training, without prohibitive investments of time. It can be met without provoking offense, projecting judgment, precipitating guilt, promoting alienation, perpetuating superstition, propagating magical thinking, or producing escapism. It can be done. The spiritual dimension offers purpose, meaning and comfort, greater partnering with patients, restoration of relationships, and relief of suffering. Therefore, we cannot allow our own ignorance, prejudice or fear to prevent us from addressing spiritual needs and the realities of our patients. To do so is to deny their reality and human dignity. It limits access to essential resources in the healing process and therefore violates the very precepts of our profession. So I hope that I reframe the issue of should you, shouldn't you pray, you know, that sort of issue with there is a requirement ethically to assess your patient's spiritual needs. Now they may dismiss it, particularly if you say, do you have any spiritual needs? You know, if you do it that way, clearly you won't get the type of response. But if you approach it from a human dignity point of view and say, is there something that would give you a greater sense of security in this process? Can I meet you there? Your practice changes. But you need to be comfortable with this first. Now, from a practical point of view, Harold Koenig developed a very memorable, very simple approach. The mnemonic is CSI Memo, and it's basically this. First of all, do you have a spiritual or religious belief? And is it a source of comfort or stress to you? In other words, does your spiritual worldview suggest that in the setting you are now with this illness or whatever, you have that it is either a resource, comforts you, or liability. You think you're cursed, you think you're um, somehow harmed or punished or abandoned or neglected. Where are you in this? Are they a source of stress or comfort? 
Will it influence your medical decisions? We know the, the most familiar perhaps Jehovah's Witnesses and the issue of blood transfusions. So would you prefer not to take medication? Uh, would you prefer not to have a blood transfusion based on your spiritual worldview? And then work with patients through that. Are you a member of a religious or spiritual group and are they supportive of you? Because they might be, bring you into the hospital, to the clinic. They may have a way to monitor your glucose. There could be self-help groups, irrespective of you know, the other religious or spiritual components. And are there any other spiritual needs? For certain, for instance, in the Buddhist group, uh, they don't want women touching the monks. So, you know, you need to deal with a nursing issue that comes with that. So one needs to be sensitive, and I'll point you to the resource that is really helpful. It's a download. It's basically a way how to, for dummies, deal with spiritual and religious issues in patient care. So this isn't so much about meeting spiritual needs as much as it is maintaining uh, religious sensitivity. So download, readily available, a couple of case studies, very, very useful. I've also produced a 15-minute clip just with the basic justification of why I think it's worth doing and giving you the liberty of moving into this area without thinking you're moving outside your ethical boundaries. You don't need to feel that way. It's physiology. It's physiology and patient-centeredness. So with that intro, I'm going to take it a little bit broader because I would like to help you start thinking in an integrative way across our dimensions of spirit, soul and body. So that it's no longer, you know, your Sunday or Saturday or Friday, whatever the spiritual practice might be, versus the rest of the week but that it actually becomes part of your humanity. And I think all of us recognize that there's been a tremendous spiritual awakening over the past 10 years. There's been a tremendous shift. Many Eastern philosophies have become the basis of psychotherapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy has moved very much to mindfulness. And uh, as far as evidence goes, there's greater support for it in many cases. So there's a, there's a shift, there's an awakening. And I'm not talking about justification here, I'm talking about observation. The movies are becoming more and more transcendent, more and more spiritual. Physics, of course, with a quantum physics concept, has created a, a space for the mind in this. In other words, you don't have to check your brain at the door to be spiritual, because there are links between physics and spirituality that are starting to bridge that, and therefore make people more receptive and accepting. There's also the concept of fractals, in other words, these self-replicating patterns, which is the best way to actually look across spirit, soul, and body. Because frequently it's more the pattern than the mechanism that relates. And I'll explain when I go to that in greater detail. Now, of course, fractals have become part of computer graphics animation, but we also look at that at heart rate variability. In other words, the autonomic nervous system can now be assessed based on how heart rate varies beat to beat. One can assess sympathetic or parasympathetic tone by looking between the beats, and that's a fractal-based understanding. There's a complete change in our understanding of water. In fact, very recently, scientists have started describing the so-called fourth phase of water, in which water is understood to be a form of a liquid computer. It forms automatic so-called exclusion zones whenever it's in proximity to a hydrophilic membrane. So immediately, if you put a hydrophilic membrane in water, there's a 10 micron clearance field where all ions, bacteria, and everything moves out. It's electrically charged and it's going to change our entire understanding of organelles and physiology. It's probably, if you think about it, uh, if you shine light on water, you increase that exclusion zone. So water and light is starting to become a very, very complex physical interaction, which approaches many of our understandings from a spiritual perspective. So we're living in very interesting times. Some of you may be aware of Professor Emoto's work on water crystals, where he freezes water at minus four degrees and takes pictures through a microscope and has experimented basically pronouncing either blessing or various words, you know, love, gratitude, Hitler, whatever, and he photographs the water crystal 
and certain things like particular music or so produce beautiful symmetric crystals and others are completely destructive. And the most powerful, positive, structurally beautiful forms of water form when they are blessed in either love or gratitude. And this, this is physics. This is measurable. So the boundaries are definitely coming closer. When we look at genetics, this is a, a documentary that I would strongly recommend for people who consider the epigenetic issue. In other words, how nurture, how food, how relationship influences the expression of genes. It's called Ghost in the Genes, but it's an absolute straight-laced documentary. And it's an excellent insight in how our genes are not necessarily our expression and how epigenetics are a big piece of that. Now, having said all of this, medicine really struggles to get out of its materialist worldview. We still work in the world of pills and scalpels. And it's very, very difficult to embrace this. We have a culture of first do no harm, you know, don't go there, stick to the facts, stick to the mechanics, and that's all very well. The dilemma is that with aging populations, with poverty, disease, and in all truth, the developments of neuroscience, we are falling behind. We're falling behind. And the challenge is, is there a way to bridge this gap? And that's the challenge that I would like to start presenting. Times are changing. Faith is becoming more important. And although we think the world is very secular, polls have shown even in Canada that 90% of people have a spiritual worldview and in the rest of the world it's even higher. So a patient you see will have a spiritual worldview and it will be part of their framework of their life and illness. The question is what do we do with that? Not everybody holds that view, they're very vocal people against it, but the evidence on which they base their principles are not really attainable and definitely not very motivating. There are those that are very concerned about the confusion of faith in medicine because of the practical implications on issues of contraception and abortion and all these sort of things that get into the mix. But two wrongs don't make a right. And it's important that we look beyond that. So, with that framework, why bother? Well, believe it or not, patients want it. In polls that have been done across the world, even those patients that had non-religious views wanted their health care providers to at least ask them about whether they had spiritual needs. So asking about it is something that's ethical, appropriate and patient-centered. Whether you can actually meet the need, that's a secondary issue. But whether you should assess the need is an ethical prerequisite. It's gone so far that the Joint Commission in America mandates that all frail care and chronic admissions require documentation that a patient's spiritual needs have been assessed. So it's become a legal requirement. Various nursing textbooks address this. A hundred out of 140 medical schools in the United States have specific training on issues of spirituality in their undergraduate training now. And with aging populations, it's been realized that the only place you get the elderly is in the communities of faith. They're not in kindergarten, they're not in primary school, high school, they're not at the workplace anymore. The only place to find them now for any sort of collective community-based intervention is within communities of faith. So there are partnerships that are developing and there are even uh, things like parish nursing where there's a nurse that's employed by the church or the community of faith to now interface with the healthcare system and make sure people are referred appropriately and actually that it works seamlessly between the two. I think it's a bright and a brave new world we could enter in if we move across the boundaries of church and state that we upheld at a time that I think it did protect individual freedom but did not necessarily meet the individual's needs. Now, we spoke about healing the heart, and when we get to definitions in spirituality, it can be very messy and confusing. So allow me this morning to give you a couple of ideas, a couple of ways to think about this, 
that may assist you in organizing your thoughts around them outside of the traditional uh, psychology and psychiatry concepts. And I'm going to discuss specifically some of the aspects of spirit, soul, body, you know, how to think about it. But I'm going to start, I'll get back to that in a moment. I'd like to start with the three basics, spirituality, religion, and mysticism. So let me just dumb this down a little bit. Spirituality has a very broad connotation, but it also has a somewhat specific one. Spirituality is a very useful term when you want to ask someone whether they have a need in that dimension. In other words, do you go to church versus do you have a spiritual worldview? So spirituality can be used as a very innocuous, very generalized way of probing that dimension of an individual from a physiological perspective. So it is very useful in an interview. From a research point of view, it's useless because it's far too broad, okay? But very, very good to open a discussion. Now, within its narrower framework, let's call it the sort of postmodern spirituality, that is usually very experiential based. So if people talk about spirituality, almost in a generic sense, it's about the experience of the spiritual. The woo-woos, the goosebumps, you know, the, it's the experience of the spiritual. Whereas mysticism is about the intellectual, if you want to call it that, the intellectual aspects of the spiritual, knowing the unknowable, those sort of, the, the, the theories behind spirituality, those are mystical or uh, attributed to mysticism, whereas religion becomes the behavioral outflow. So religion defines what you do, spirituality defines how you feel about it, and mysticism, what the relational framework is, or what the transcendent view really is. So I hope that's somewhat helpful, just in clarifying terms. Science asks what questions? What's this? What's that? What's the observation? Spirituality addresses why. Why are we here? What's my purpose? Where am I going? Now let's quickly just look at the whole pursuit of health. Well, our modern mindset towards disease is we identify an agent that makes you sick, pathogen. We look at the process of getting sick, that's pathogenesis. And then we look at pathophysiology as well as vulnerability or predisposition. So we basically look at why you get sick, what makes you sick, and how do you get sick. Based on that, we give it a name which is the disease or the disorder. And within modern medicine or therapies, we have three approaches. Kill it, help the body, or block what happens in between. So allopathy kills, cuts, burns, removes. Homeopathy strengthens, supports, builds, nurtures. And alternative medicine interrupts the pathway as a broad philosophical concept. All have relative validity. All, in certain contexts, have evidence-based proof, but they are at the lowest level of intervention. In other words, things have run their course, and now you deal with the physical realities. So it's downstream. And we all know, in addition to what we do, there are causes, and it's been called deadly emotions. We know that fear, unforgiveness, shame, these sort of things, and I'll clarify those in a moment, they do cause ill health, loss of well-being, loss of quality of life. But how do they relate? Well, I hope to give you a few answers. Conventionally, at this level, we have sent people to mental health practitioners. So we've sent them to psychiatrists and psychologists. The psychiatrists have moved more to the biology, so they also use medication. The psychologists have moved more towards spirituality transpersonal psychology, so it's moved in the different direction. So it's become a little bit split over those. But in addition to what our minds are able to embrace, there is a higher level. We just don't quite know what it is or how it relates to the physical. And that's what I'd like to address. Now from a conventional research point of view, you've got two aspects 
the theory of how spirituality and health relate, and the praxis of what do you do. Those are the two areas. If you want to get a snapshot of probably 35,000 peer-reviewed articles over the past 40 years, the easiest way, if you really want to go there, is to get Harold Koenig's two handbooks of religion and health. It covers all the, the summaries of all the articles and papers and their insights in how spirituality and health relate. For the most part positive, but not always, particularly if people feel that they're being punished by the deity to whom they submit. So that's probably the best quick access, and they think there's a lot of information there. The way in which science has approached this is not to presume anything supernatural. It just looks at what are the features we can measure and what are the implications we can measure. So it says someone goes to church, which means fewer go nuts, they've got more people around them that can help, and they're less likely to smoke because someone's going to scold them. Right? <laughs> then there are various mediators for disease, and there are ultimately different systems that may be affected. And they do what is called structured equation models. So this relates positively to that, negatively to that, positively to that. And thereby, they can develop correlations. It doesn't give you mechanism, but it gives you association. So that's one of the standard models. But the question I asked and have been wrestling with for the past seven years is, how do these pieces fit together? And the nomenclature doesn't help. Because in the sort of Greek Roman model, you've got spirit, soul, body. In the Hebrew, you've got seven different non material aspects of man. You've got the nefesh or soul, you've got the ruach or heart, you've got the neshoma or intelligence, you've got the chaya, which is life, you've got the yachida, which is the oneness, uniqueness, belovedness, belonging but separate. So, you know, it's, it's a far broader framework. And then there are, of course, many other religions with their own terminology. Not all languages really permit the concept of mind. So it's very difficult across languages, across disciplines, across religions to work with terminology. And in my frustration and looking at this, first of all, I recognize the following. One is, it's not watertight compartments. It's far more like families. It's an interaction. So we need to recognize this is not about naming an animal. This is about describing a dynamic. And that's an important precept. Secondly, I came up with the idea, I guess, to use a standard way in which we organize many things in anatomy and physiology. And that's on the basis of input, process, and output. Because anything that is sentient, anything that is reactive, anything that is alive has the capacity to input, the ability to process, and then the capacity to respond. That's the nature of life. So what I thought is, maybe I could categorize according to those concepts and bring order to otherwise the seeming chaos. And we're familiar with this. In a, in a nerve cell, you've got the dendrite, that's primarily responsible for input, the soma, that's primarily responsible for process, and the axon that's primarily responsible for output. And if you look at the concepts of spirit cell body, you'll see that it actually mirrors that. The spirit is the source of inspiration and intuition, so there's a recipient aspect. The soul is the thought process where language and decisions are made. And then the body becomes the behavioral mechanism through which it's manifested or expressed. So across spirit cell body you see that. And in fact, if you look at electroencephalography, basically where you do like an ECG of the brain, which they typically have done with epilepsy, but is becoming far more refined, you can actually see that pattern. You've got the ultra-low frequencies, which is sub-dreaming. Then you've got delta, which is deep sleep. You've got theta, which is sort of semi-spiritual twilight, waking up, hypnagogic, visionary sort of states, shamanic states. Then you've got alpha, which is where you're just relaxed with your eyes closed. You've got beta, where you're actually actively problem solving. And you've got gamma, which is the expression in the body. So you actually see this process of differentiation from input process to output. It's quite consistent. But what do we do with that on Monday morning? 
So let me see if I can answer some of those questions. So just keep in mind this input process, output concept, and let me now apply it, albeit in a limited form, to the concepts of spirit, soul, and body. And I'll start with the one you're probably most familiar with. Most of us would recognize the soul or the psyche as the capacity for emotion, thought, and will. Would you agree? I mean, that's a fairly standard understanding. So let's organize that. Emotion is what you receive, thought is what you process, and will is the precursor to action. Can you see it? Just organized along those lines. Emotion, thought, will. Precursor to output. Let's take it now up a level, but before I do that, let me also clarify the function of the soul. The soul's craving is meaning. Meaning. What is the meaning of life? Who's in this journey with me? Where's my car? Will we have coffee together? Do I enjoy my job? That's the level of the soul. Meaning. If you look at the spirit, the equivalents there are intuition or inspiration, which is the recipient component. You have the communion or relational, you could call it mystical if you want, but there's the communion aspect with the sacred or the divine or God. And then the conscience is the gatekeeper for what becomes manifest. In other words, it is the precursor to action. In the way the will relates to the soul, the conscience relates to the spirit. Do you get that? Just in principles. The spirit is not so much preoccupied with meaning, but it is very, very intentional about purpose. You can have a life that is miserable in the most decrepit of circumstances, but if you understand your purpose, you are able to endure. The reverse is not true. The reverse is not true. Meaning alone does not keep us. And I think that's where Frankel's um, logotherapy blurs, because it looks at meaning, not at purpose. And it's very difficult to make meaning out of everything. Using an analogy in the body quickly, there are immune cells that are designed to react with a specific antigen that they never get to face. They never get to face. Does that mean they're without meaning? Quite possibly, because they never did anything. But does it mean they were without purpose? No. No, it doesn't. So that is the level of the spirit. So let's look at the body now. And this is where I started scratching my head. And then I was reminded of some of the references uh, in religious texts that refer to us being woven together. And I was reminded embryologically how when we are formed in the womb, we essentially differentiate into three layers. And this is standard embryology, 101. You can refer to this in any textbook. And the bottom line is this. As the embryo and the inner cell mass differentiates, it stratifies into three layers, and those layers form themes or thematic organs. And they are as follows. You have the organs that are dedicated to the process of regulation of thought, which is ectoderm, on which the skin, your organ of interest, is one. The brain nervous system as well. Then you have those organs dedicated to manifestation or action or locomotor system, and they make up blood, lymph, uh, immune system, muscles, joints, heart and kidneys. And then you have the organs dedicated to receiving. Receiving oxygen into the lungs, receiving nutrition into the intestines, manipulating energy through the endocrine system. And so thematically, you have input or endoderm, process or ectoderm, and manifestation or mesoderm. Those are the themes, and you can actually put them along that scaffolding. The beauty of this is it gives you a thematic a picture of how to think about these things rather than the categorical, well, there's a heart and there's a liver. You can think, but where does it fit into the scheme? What is its purpose? And that gives you a different perspective that opens things up. 
Now the body is responsible for mechanism. So the soul for meaning, the spirit for purpose, and the body for mechanism. And that's how one could describe their relationship. Input, process, output. To summarize, endoderm input, emotions input soul, intuition or inspiration input spirit, ectoderm process body, thought process soul, communion process spirit, conscience pre-behavior or pre-action spirit, will pre-action soul, mesoderm the eventual manifestation of action in the body. Okay, do you get the pattern? You start to see the themes. Okay, so where do these things go wrong? Well, they go wrong when our minds go wrong. And most of you would be familiar with the amygdala. The amygdala is an almond-shaped organ in association with a temporal lobe. It's the gatekeeper for our strongest emotional memories. So it's the filter through which, or the grid through which we see life. If I communicate with you, the amygdalas have different functions. If I look at you right eye to right eye, I'm communicating emotion. If I look at you left eye to left eye, I'm communicating data. You'll notice you experience it completely differently. If I look at you and I say, how are you? Or I look at you here, how are you? You'll experience it completely differently. This is part of our wiring. And the amygdala is actually made to sample six different clusters of stimulus, if you like. And this is Rita Carter's assimilation in a book called Mapping the Mind. But basically, some of the strongest senses we have is the sense of fear, the sense of guilt or anger, and the sense of disgust or shame. So let's call it fear, guilt, shame. We then have two attractants. The one is towards pleasure, of which the worst might be called lust. You know, when you pursue something you'd like in a wrongful way. Or enticement, which is where you're curious about something and you get attracted to something in a wrongful way. So, you know, those would be the extremes of it. And lastly, the pain of relational loss or grief. So this is standard neuroscience. And this is an example of a biblical text referring to the consequences of relational loss producing fear, guilt, and shame. Now, what causes you to feel fear? Well, obviously, a threat. A threat to your security causes fear. What causes guilt or anger? An offense. Right, wrong. That was wrong. That was wrong. Why didn't they? They should have. That's an offense that produces anger or guilt if it's you that made the mistake. And lastly, if I devalue you or I devalue something of value, that produces either disgust or shame. So fear, guilt, and shame are the responses to threats, offense, and insult. And life, the school of hard knocks, gives us more than enough of this. The question is, what do we do with it? Do we become conditioned by it? Because unfortunately, we do. When you're on your way here this morning, I better not be late, I need to get up now. Oh, what are they going to say if I'm not there? What are they going to think of me if I'm not? You've just used fear, guilt, and shame to condition yourself. And we do it to our kids too. Now, I'm not even going to get in what we should be doing. That's, that's a different aspect. But we wonder why our bodies fall apart. And yet we condition ourselves with the very things that cause distress. And your patients do too. So, let me take it to the next and last step. You will find if you look at medical conditions that the organs of the endoderm are the ones most vulnerable to shame. Fear of abandonment, fear of abuse, be it verbal, sexual, emotional, physical, causes endoderm issues. Asthma, irritable bowel syndrome being the classic examples. It's fear of abuse. Fear causes dysregulation, whether it's hypertension, mental derangement, special sense derangements, it's a fear track. And I'll show you the scientific underpinnings in a moment. And guilt and anger primarily affects our mesodermal areas. Inflammation, breakdown of structures, even cancer, as I'll explain in a moment. Now this may seem like very bold statements, and I accept that you would say that. 
But the most advanced form of mind-body medicine, the discipline is called psychoneuroimmunoendocrinology. Neuroectoderm, immunomesoderm, endocrinology, endoderm. They haven't recognized it, but that's what it is. The focus is already there. So we need to pursue it, and I look forward to differentiating this. I'm not defending this as a definitive model. I'm presenting this as a scaffolding for thought and exploration. The core issue is we need a broader framework because we spend a lot of resources in the physical for something that should be addressed in the psychological but would do even better in the spiritual if that's reoriented. So let me give you a sampling of the fear continuum. You can get three possibilities, short-term fear, intermediate-term fear, or personality-based fear, which we call trait anxiety. Each of those cause different levels of derangement, but all through our sympathetic hypothalamic adrenal axis, so our alarm system. And the diseases that go along with that are dysregulation of ectodermal organs. If you look at the guilt continuum, short-term reaction, long-term anger, or trait-based hostility, we find that blood joints become influenced. We know, for instance, that anger is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular problems and thrombosis, apart from cholesterol. We also know that your ability of chromosomes to divide as a result of the tips called the telomeres shorten in hostile people. So it shortens the number of your days, predisposes you to mutation, and makes you more vulnerable to cancer. I mean, there's mechanistic evidence for that. In the shame continuum again, short-term embarrassment, longer-term shame, long-term inferiority affects people through the neuropeptides, of which vasoactive and testal polypeptide is in fact perhaps one of the most important. It's the one where the AIDS virus actually docks. So in other words, the molecule that should give you a sense of fulfillment and dignity and enjoyment of life is actually the access portal for the HIV virus. It's extraordinary. And as I said, there's definite association between the sort of type D personality it's called, which is this cataclysmic thinking, woe is me, I'm, going, I'm doomed, and irritable bowel. It's that dread of abuse, dread of being shamed. If you look at the workplace, we all say we're stressed. It's not that simple. It's unjust stress. We're held to responsibilities for which we have no authority, so there's fear, we know it's wrong, so we're offended, and we're going to be set up for failure, which means shame. So fear, guilt, and shame collaborate to give us that whole cluster of derangements. Now, what do you do as a health practitioner? I'm going to keep it simple. We already covered this. Your job is not going to be to unpack the whole person's dynamic. You can get into that over time, but please start with polling the person's transcendent worldview by asking them, do you have a worldview of that nature? Is it a comfort or stress to you? Will it change the way I need to treat you? Do you have support? And is there anything else I need to consider? Ask the question. If that's too long, at least say, do you have spiritual concerns? That's perhaps the shortest way to ask. But I think what has been said multiple times during this conference is relationship. There's an example of Abram and Abimelech in scripture where Abimelech gets sick for the reason of abducting Abram's wife inadvertently. And Abram prays for him, his harem gets healed, and in the next verse Sarah falls pregnant. So it's that confess your faults one to another and you will be healed. We see that clearly there. In Job, which is typically the, the chapter people would quote if they say, well, it's sort of inexplicable suffering, Job's fate is reversed when he prays for his friends, when there's reconciliation, when there is that interaction. So relationship is critical. In the last few moments that remain, let me cover some do's, don'ts, and dangers. Religion and spirituality can be a hindrance because it may conflict with appropriate standards of care. And that is perhaps the toughest thing to deal with. You can put people into judgmentalism, blaming them for their disease. You can alienate them, 
cause additional strain, or have two primary faith-based concerns. And these are the two things you'll probably encounter the most in a South African context. People who have faith in faith. In other words, they stand on God's promises, they stand on the Word, they stand on their faith, but not the author of their faith. And sometimes the author of the faith has a more complex idea than the simple faith-only approach. And people need to be mentored through that in a dignified way. Because they can be trapped in something that blocks them from all help there is. The other possibility is fear faith, where you go into sort of a, uh, a sacramental overload of renunciations, of prayers, of rituals, of trying to find the next best expert to somehow get the key to the lock. What is going to release God's willingness to heal a person, for instance? And that is a very, very, very um, awkward state to be in, because the person is essentially an opponent rather than a partner in the process. And those are the most common things you'll find in chronic or terminal disease. Faith and faith and fear faith in people who have a religious mindset. And you need help by chaplains, their own spiritual leaders, to work through those issues. Social neglect, someone has a near-death experience, has a very, very profound spiritual change, and now suddenly neglects all their social responsibilities and family, etc., etc. How do you deal with that? People can go into guilt. They thought they were sick, now they know they're sinners. You know, so you, 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 need to, you need to work with this very carefully. And people have negative religious coping. God abandoned me, the church abandoned me, you know, nobody loves me, woe is me. So those are also areas where they need resolution. <coughs> They're dangers. You can offend a patient if you approach them primarily from a spiritual point of view. You've got a demon, you know, and this, this needs to be cast out. And in a certain setting, I would say that might be the best thing to do. However, it could be the absolutely worst thing to do if there's an obvious organic problem which is neglected. You can offend the person's family. Uh, you can fall into not being respectful because you basically don't like their brand of religion. You could uh, have them develop inappropriate conclusions. In Catholic people, if you start with the Bible, they think you're arranging last rites for them. You know, so am I that sick? Has it come to this? Is it now prayer? So be careful how you do this. Uh, we shouldn't be blunt instruments. And of course, if you open this, people are going to ask you questions. And you need to know what you're going to say. I'm not an expert, I'm just polling your needs. I would like to refer you to someone, I think, who can help. So just be aware, if you go there, you need to go there and need to deal with that. It can be a wonderful way to help people. In fact, it's a way to partner with patients even if you have different spiritual worldviews. Because the fact the person knows that you understand the concept allows you to relate at a different level, even if they're differences. They will tend to commit to the process of healing to a great extent if you have found each other in the fullness of your humanity. It could provide community support and change the course of illness. If you look at breast cancer survival, for instance, and it changes your practice from something that's draining to something that's fulfilling. Because giving at the level of the soul is demanding. The soul is alive, but it is not designed to transmit life. That's the burnout. The spiritual area is the resource that keeps you going, the purpose, the motivation. That's the part that's life-giving. So that's the resource that you and your patients need access to. How do you avoid the dangers? Patient-centeredness. Not your religious agenda, not your attempt to proselytize, evangelize, or whatever eyes, patient-centeredness. What will meet them where they are? Priorities. Spurting pulse, close the bleeding blood vessel. You know, blood before Bible. Follow your sensible standards of care. Go from the general to the specific. If the person wants to punch you when you ask about smoking, you probably want to avoid issues of spirituality during that interview. So, you know, have common sense. <coughs> give them an opportunity to respond to spiritual things, and often people will give you cues. They say, you know, I prayed about this, or, you know, I was in church, and 
and it will tell you you've got permission to go there, but go there gently and wisely. If you decide to meet a patient in whatever way within the spiritual domain, get their permission. And this is not, all right, you're about to die and I'm going to put a scalpel in your chest, would you like me to pray for you? Because that would be abuse of authority and a violation of ethics. If you would say, Mrs. So-and-so, I see you're very anxious. I noticed that you had a Bible on your bedside. Some patients derive enormous comfort if they have an opportunity to pray with a person helping them. Would that be meaningful to you? I won't mind if you don't. I just feel I should offer that to you because it may be meaningful. The person can say, no, thank you, without feeling guilty, or yes, please, doctor. And in that case, it creates a completely different environment. And even if they said no, they will look at you differently because you thought of it. You thought of it. It was dignified. Ask about sensitivity. Some people how very strict the word Jehovah would offend some. Even Jesus would offend others. They want Yeshua, you know, especially in South Africa with certain trends nowadays. So be sure that you meet people without compromising yourself. You don't need to. Offer faith consistent support or arrange access to that support and always be respectful. In the interest of time, you're going to have to, for the moment, just trust you know, the outcomes that were there. A lot of evidence that anxiety, when it's alleviated, helps people. And I tell you, you can't reason with fear when your mind can solve the puzzle. If you don't have answers, the soul will not be reassured. You can't solve it at that level. The people need a higher level of anchoring. And it's only ethical for you to offer that. I'm going to move just to the uh, conclusions here. And that is to point out some of the resources. Spirituality and patient care is probably the best value for money. It really gives you the nuts and bolts. If you're interested in collaboration with communities of faith, there are models to do that. If you want to do research, there's Harold Koenig's summer workshop, which I attended. So that's Harold Koenig. There are validated scales for forgiveness, bitterness, mysticism, you name it, there are validated scientific scales if you're actually interested in doing research. There are good references on mind-body medicine from a scientific point of view and two thick books on psychoneuroimmunology. And if you want to look at peptides, neuropeptides, the molecules of emotion, then there's very, very good work uh, on, on that as well. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid for recognizing that we as humans have spirituality. Don't confuse patients with your particular approach. Allow people to recognize that you're extending dignity, extending dignity primarily, and that your desire is to meet their needs, not your own. If we approach people with an agenda, they end up being the enemy. You don't need to do that. You can relax in that setting. I hope that uh, I may have challenged, stimulated, interested you, or broadened your views in this area, and that you would have permission to go there in a way that would be meaningful to you and invaluable to your patients. Thank you.